So for a long, long time, when we talked about how big institutions, you know, pension funds, endowments manage their money, the dominant framework was strategic asset allocation, SAA. Right. That's the classic approach. Right. Think long-term targets for different asset classes, stocks, bonds, that kind of thing. It's all rooted in modern portfolio theory, really. Balancing risk and expected return over the long haul, setting those fixed weights. And it definitely brought structure, discipline, a shared language for everyone involved. Absolutely. It worked well, particularly for institutions with fairly stable cash flows, not too much leverage, maybe modest amounts of illiquid stuff, and importantly, pretty stable views about how markets behave. But the conversation seems to be shifting, doesn't it? We're hearing much more about something called the total portfolio approach or TPA. We are. It's not like it appeared overnight, but it's definitely gaining momentum, really an evolution in thinking, driven by the fact that the world looks, you know, a bit different now. More complex, maybe more volatile. It sounds like TPA is a response to the feeling that SAA, that traditional approach, might be hitting its limits in today's environment. That's a good way to put it. The macroeconomic landscape, geopolitics. Yeah. Things are just less stable. Okay, so that's what we want to dig into today. What exactly is this total portfolio approach? How does it fundamentally differ from SAA? What's the theory behind it? How do institutions actually do it? And crucially, what are the potential downsides or challenges? That's our mission for this deep dive. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. And maybe the best place to start is why the shift? What are those limitations of SAA that you mentioned? Yeah, let's talk about that. You hinted at it. The assumptions baked into SAA seem a bit shakier these days. Exactly. SAA implicitly assumes things like risk premia, the extra return you expect for taking risk, are pretty stable over time. It assumes the relationships between assets, their correlations, are also somewhat predictable and stationary. And that you can actually rebalance your portfolio easily when you need to. Right. That assumes markets are liquid. Yeah. It also kind of assumes asset classes operate independently to some degree and that markets eventually revert to their long-term averages mean reversion. But think about the last, say, 15, 20 years. The global financial crisis in 08, all the unconventional monetary policy, COVID, the inflation spike in 2022. Big systemic shocks. Exactly. Those events really threw a wrench into those assumptions, didn't they? Stable correlations. Not so much when everything tanks together. Precisely. During crises like the GFC or the initial COVID shock, diversification benefits often evaporated just when you needed them most. Correlations spiked, liquidity dried up. So trying to stick rigidly to your preset SAA targets and rebalance, that must have been incredibly difficult, maybe even counterproductive. It absolutely was for many. Risk models based on historical data failed spectacularly. Institutions found themselves constrained, unable to react effectively because the SAA framework wasn't built for that kind of sudden, dramatic regime shift. And it's not just the big crises, is it? There's also the growing allocation to private markets, private equity, real estate, infrastructure. That must complicate the SAA picture, too. Hugely. These assets are inherently illiquid. You can't just mark them to market easily every day, and you certainly can't trade in and out of them quickly to hit precise allocation targets. So your actual portfolio can drift quite far from your target SAA. And getting back is tough. It creates this path dependency you mentioned earlier. Yeah, exactly right. Past decisions, particularly large commitments to illiquid funds with long lockups, really dictate your future flexibility. Rebalancing becomes a much slower, more complex process, sometimes impossible in the short term. SAA wasn't really designed for a world with such large chunks of illiquidity. So let's be clear, SAA isn't necessarily wrong, but maybe it was designed for a simpler, more predictable world than the one we're navigating now. That's a fair summary. Its utility diminishes as complexity and volatility increase. And that's the gap TPA aims to fill. Okay, so let's pivot to TPA. You said it's more of a response, a way to handle this growing complexity and instability. Yes. Think of TPA not as a rigid formula, but more as a mindset shift. 
It's about looking at the entire portfolio, all assets, public and private, liquid and illiquid as one integrated whole, almost like a, a, a living balance sheet for the fund. A living balance sheet. I like that. So less about separate silos for stocks, bonds, private equity. Exactly. The core principle is evaluate every single investment decision, whether it's buying a stock, committing to a private fund, or using an overlay based on its marginal impact on the total fund. Marginal impact on what specifically? On the total fund's overall risk profile, its liquidity position, meaning access to cash, its expected return, but also its flexibility, its ability to adapt to changing circumstances down the road. It breaks down those traditional asset class barriers. Well, what are the big trends pushing funds in this direction? You mentioned complexity. Yeah, rising portfolio complexity is key. The growth of illiquids, the use of derivatives, overlays, bespoke mandates, it all means those traditional policy benchmark weights in SAA become less and less meaningful representations of the true portfolio risks and exposures. And the market instability we talked about. That's the second driver. Greater market turbulence, more frequent and pronounced shifts in economic regimes, think high inflation, low growth, etc. This means relying on long-term averages is riskier. Risk premia aren't constant, they change depending on the environment correlations become unstable. You need to be more aware of the current regime and potential future scenarios. Makes sense. And the third piece, is it just that we can do this now? That's a big part of it. The maturation of tools and infrastructure. We now have much more sophisticated risk engines that can look across the whole portfolio, better liquidity modeling tools, extensive scenario libraries to test resilience, and factor-based analysis. Factor-based. You mean looking at underlying drivers like value, growth, momentum across everything? Precisely. Looking at those common risk factors across both public and private assets gives you a much more coherent view of your actual exposures than just looking at asset class labels. So the tech and the quantitative tools have caught up, making TPA practically feasible in a way it wasn't, say, 20 years ago. So TPA is moving away from that static precision of SAA towards something more like strategic adaptability, from siloed buckets to coordinated positioning across the whole fund. You got it. And shifting from relying solely on long horizon averages to incorporating dynamic scenario planning. It's about managing the portfolio as that single unified balance sheet we mentioned. Okay, let's dig into the what a bit more. If it's a mindset, what does that look like in practice? Well, it means truly managing public and private market exposures together. Thinking about how your private equity commitments influence the kind of liquid assets you need to hold, for example, or how you pace your private investments over time. So the liquid part of the portfolio isn't just sitting there. It's actively designed as a buffer. Yes, exactly. Designing the liquid portfolio stocks, bonds, cash, specifically to act as a dynamic buffer. It needs to absorb shocks, provide cash for commitments or opportunities, and generally preserve the fund's flexibility, especially given the illiquidity elsewhere. And you mentioned something earlier, intertemporal hedging. Sounds complex. It sounds fancy, but the core idea is simple making decisions today that protect your ability to respond effectively to future changes. It's about preserving options. Like ensuring you have enough liquidity to meet capital calls even if markets are down, or having the capacity to take advantage of dislocations. Precisely. It's about thinking through time how today's choices affect tomorrow's flexibility under different potential scenarios. It's not about constant tinkering or market timing, but about making conditional adjustments based on careful monitoring, strong governance, good tools, and clear processes. Okay, that leads naturally into implementation. It sounds great in theory, but making it work must be challenging. How do organizations actually do TPA? It's definitely a journey, not an overnight switch. There's a useful framework some use. Should, could, would, and how. Okay, break that down. What's should? Should is about the foundational investment beliefs. Does the organization, the board, the investment team genuinely believe that risk premia vary over time? that liquidity is strategically important, that markets move through different regimes. So a philosophical buy-in. Exactly. Without that shared belief, trying to implement PPA will lack conviction. You need that philosophical underpinning. Otherwise, why bother changing from the simpler SAA? Makes sense. What about could? Could relates to the governance structure. Can the governance model support this more dynamic approach? Traditionally, boards oversee specific asset class targets. Under TPA, the board needs to shift its focus. They might set broader guardrails ranges for asset classes, maybe, but more importantly, limits on total portfolio risk, liquidity levels, or key factor sensitivities. Then they empower the investment team to manage dynamically within those guardrails. 
Oversight becomes more about outcomes and the quality of the decision-making process, less about hitting fixed targets. That sounds like a big shift for a board. Is there a downside there? Absolutely. The potential downside is the difficulty in shifting that board mindset. There's also a risk. If the guardrails aren't well-defined or monitored, then management could potentially overstep or take unintended risks. It requires real trust and transparency. Okay, so you need the belief should and the governance could. What's would? Would is all about the organizational culture. Do the internal culture support TPA? This means fostering collaboration across teams, public markets, private markets, risk management, are incentives aligned with total fund outcomes, not just siloed benchmark performance. Is there support for flexible, sometimes contrarian decision making? Breaking down those internal silos we talked about, I can see how that could be tough. Very tough. Resistance to change is natural. Teams used to operating independently, judged on their specific asset class returns versus a benchmark, might find it hard to adapt to a more integrated, total fund-focused approach. Changing deeply ingrained cultural norms is often the hardest part. And the final piece, how? How is the toolkit. Do you have the necessary systems and analytical capabilities? This means tools for getting that portfolio-wide view of exposures, factors, liquidity, stress tests under different scenarios. It requires systems for dynamic risk modeling, maybe regime-based portfolio construction, and real-time tracking of how the portfolio is positioned relative to those guardrails. So sophisticated risk engines, scenario analysis tools, you mentioned factor models earlier, anything else specific? Some funds use techniques like reverse optimization. Instead of feeding assumptions into a model to get an allocation, you start with a potential portfolio and see what kind of market views or assumptions are implied by it. It can be a more intuitive way to build robust portfolios. Interesting. But relying heavily on complex tools has its own risks, doesn't it? Model risk. Definitely a potential downside. You need to understand the limitations of your models. Data can be imperfect, especially for privates. Models can be misspecified. There's a real danger of relying too much on the quantitative output without enough qualitative judgment and common sense overlay. Plus, implementing and maintaining this kind of advanced infrastructure is expensive and complex. So under TPA, governance shifts from fixed targets to principled boundaries. And performance evaluation has to change too. It can't just be about hitting asset class benchmarks. Exactly. Performance evaluation needs to focus more on total fund outcomes relative to the fund's objectives and risk tolerance. It also needs to assess the effectiveness of that cross-team collaboration and the quality of the dynamic decisions made within the established guardrails. But that sounds harder to measure, doesn't it? Attributing success or failure when everything is integrated. It is harder. That's another potential downside or challenge. Developing new metrics and valuation approaches that fairly assess performance in an integrated TPA framework is crucial, but not straightforward. Okay, this has been really illuminating. So to sort of wrap up, TPA isn't a specific allocation strategy, but a fundamental shift in mindset. It's about managing the portfolio holistically, recognizing the interconnectedness, and prioritizing adaptability in a complex and uncertain world. That's the core message. Moving away from the static SIA blueprint towards a more dynamic, conditional approach to decision making. It emphasizes forward-looking design thinking about future possibilities and requires real alignment between your investment beliefs, your governance, your culture, and the tools you use. So a final thought for you, the listener, to mull over. Consider how this shift from static planning, like SAA, towards what we might call purposeful readiness under TPA. How might that idea apply beyond just investments? How does aiming for readiness and adaptability, rather than a fixed plan, change how we approach other complex challenges or long-term goals in our own lives or organizations, especially when faced with increasing uncertainty? Something to think about. A great point to end on. It's a powerful concept. 